Um, uh, what I want to do in this first part is sort of lay out a way of thinking about some of the core concepts that uh, could underlie Article 12, that do underlie Article 12, but I think we have a, um, a bit of work to do in creating, in, in, in detailing uh, the kind of theoretical foundations on which we might develop an adequate framework of, of law policy and practice to give it real effect in people's lives. Um, so I want to work, work through that before the, before the break and we'll give lots of time for questions and feedback and critique and uh, uh, suggestion. I also want to say I come at this as a sociologist. So I'm not, a, I think I'm the first non-lawyer to speak now in this. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or, or, or a bad thing, but I come at this as a sociologist who's done qualitative research for many years with people with intellectual disabilities and their families, um, and as a policy researcher to try and figure out how we move forward a law and policy reform agenda to address the systematic ways in which people have been excluded and denied the opportunities to pursue a good life and realize a good life uh, in, in, their, in their communities. Um, but I'm, I, I, I draw upon, in, in a kind of very um, uh, uh, mercenary uh, and untutored way, my own reading in law and philosophy to help me put together some tools to, to build this foundation. So I want to share some of that thinking and how I'm putting that together through conversations with so many people uh, in Canada and around the world, we've got many people in this room who are really a great community of thinkers uh, in trying to figure out how to move this forward. So that's the context for, for, for the discussion. Um, we've all, you know, been through Article 12 many, many times. Um, I just want to highlight a few kind of key, key words. Um, on an equal basis with others, a right to enjoy legal capacity on an unequal basis with others. And Jerome yesterday articulated the importance of that uh, concept as we think about the application of, of the Articles in the Convention. Access to support, that's another, that was one of the leading kind of uh, breakthroughs in, in the Convention. And we're going to do some thinking about that today and, and discussion. And then safeguards um, on measures related to legal capacity proportional, tailored, respect, will, and difference. Those are the kind of core concepts that uh, I think need some further elaboration if we're going to create and figure out a path forward. Um, I want to go to the definition of legal capacity because we don't, um, I went back recently to the uh, definition that the Office of the High, uh, UN High Commissioner uh, for human rights uh, provided in that background document, I think it was for the ad hoc committee in like 2005 or, yeah. Um, what's very, very helpful, I think, and important about this definition is that the, we know legal capacity is about the capacity to have rights and, and the capacity to act. And the capacity to act is intended, the, the, the office says, and I've got capability question mark because I'm going to come to uh, I agree very, very, and I didn't know that's where you were going, that, that I think the framework, Marcia Sen's framework of capabilities is really a key, uh, a key solution to, uh, to cracking open Article 12 in a really productive way for us, in a way that helps us tackle some of the, the conundrums. Um, so it's intended as the capacity and the power to engage in a particular undertaking or transaction. So it's about having a status, it's about having well, a, a power to make things happen. And we often talk about Article 12 as, you know, it's about um, the capacity to make choices, make, be able to make decisions in your life. Actually, the, the definition I think is very helpful because it focuses on power. Do you, are you accorded the power to engage in legal relationships? And, and that's really what, what we've got to build. We have to create the conditions of, for the, for people with disabilities to have the power to engage in, re in legal relationships. And that's, I think, uh, one of the, as we go forward in thinking that this through, that's what really, re those are the criteria, we've got to figure out the criteria for that. Are we putting in place the conditions for people to have the power to engage in, modify, extinguish legal relationships? So that's really 
one of the things that's guiding me in, 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 in the thinking around this. Um, now, I know people don't want to use the word paradigm shift, but I am going to use it because we need to use it in a very specific way. There is a paradigm shift in Article 12 in values, as Jerome said yesterday, and I think in seeding uh, an alternative theoretical framework. I think we made a real leap in the convention with the notion of supports. I mean, that used to be, that used to be the, uh, uh, you needed support to exercise your legal capacity. That was evidence you couldn't exercise it in the first place. Like, we broke through that contradiction with Article 12, and that's the paradigm shift. We've made, we're nowhere near making a paradigm shift in law, policy, or practice I, anywhere in the world. There's incremental reform, but as, as Jerome said yesterday, that what constitutes a paradigm shift is down the road a ways, after all of those incremental steps, we realize we're in a new place. And I don't think we're in a new place yet when it comes to Article 12. We're doing good work. We're doing good work in Canada. You're doing good work in Ireland. We're, but I don't... I think there's a huge gap between the paradigm shift we've made in values and I think theoretical foundations and where we're at and even conceiving of, of law policy and practice. And that's another theme that I want to sort of pick up through, through the discussion is what do we do if in fact we've only made a paradigm shift in, in, in values and theory and we're no, in nowhere in a position to make the full paradigm shift in law, policy, and practice. What does that mean for how we think about the obligations going forward? Um, uh, so, legal capacity, the power to create, modify, extinguish, terminate legal relationships. That's the, the frame. And, and I'm gonna, let's just be sort of really basic here. We're talking about healthcare decisions, the power to enter legal relationships in order to get my healthcare needs met. We're talking about financial and property decisions, and we're talking about personal life uh, decisions. Where I'm going to live, who I'm going to live with, things I care about, relationships that matter to me, etc. So those are the kind of basic daily decisions. And we're going to come back to these, but let's, in terms of some of the building blocks for building a, an adequate theory here. And there's various, uh, I mean, I think the point's been made many times, and we won't detail it now, but you know, we, Article 12 is one of those foundational articles in terms of its interdependence with various other articles in, in, in the convention. Um, uh, approaches to assessing the capacity to act. This is another, in terms of building our thinking around this, we've talked about the difference between the status approach and the outcomes approach and the functional approach. Um, and you know the status approach, and we still see that in some civil codes and, and, and legal frameworks. You know, you have a mental disorder. On that basis, you're going to be treated differently. Um, uh, outcomes approach. Uh, you've got you know this much risk. A person can make this much, take decisions with, within this scope, but you start to go you know way out on, on the margins, and we're going to restrict your legal capacity. And those have been systematically kind of critiqued. I think we're, there's sort of agreement that we've made some headway with the functional approach that, you know, capacity to act needs to be uh, assessed on a decision-specific uh, basis. Um, but I think there's, and, and that's, that's we, you know, we've moved beyond plenary guardianship into partial guardianship and substitute decision-making. We see that as, a, as a, some headway, and we've, the functional approach to assessing capacity is provided as a basis to do that. But here, here's an, one of the examples where we also know this really doesn't do it. Like, the functional approach isn't really going to break through uh, the, the, conun the, the core issues around how people's capacity to act is, is denied. So I think we're beginning to ask, you know, is it enough? Is the functional approach the right way to proceed? Do we need another approach to thinking about capacity and how we, we assess it if, if it needs to be assessed in, in disputes? Um, so I want to pick up that question. Uh, and, and what I'm doing in this part of it is we're kind of building the concepts to uh, around which or on which we can, I think, craft out um, uh, a framework that, that will come closer to realizing in law and policy the paradigm shift that we've seen in values and, and beginning to see in theory. Um, 
So let's look at the functional approach and see if it's actually workable. Um, the usual criterion for assessment in the functional approach on his or her own, independently, an adult with supports and accommodation as needed now to make the functional assessment test, you know, compliant, if you will, with the, the convention, with supports and accommodation um, as needed, you know, the person can understand the information relevant to a decision, appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences, communicate the, the decision. So the usual understand and appreciate test. But the, the, the kind of innovation that we're seeing now as we apply the functional uh, test and, and, and expand it, try to make it more compliant with Article 12 is, is that, you know, we're going to provide people a range of supports and, and accommodations in order to meet uh, that test uh, in a way that won't uh, result in their legal capacity being restricted in any way with respect to those decisions, areas of decision that we talked about. Um, but this, the functional approach still rests on the kind of standard or dominant account of, of, of what it means to be a person who exercises legal capacity. We're still talking about, you know, Michael in his own head can appreciate and understand the, 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 the nature and consequences of, of the options before him with respect to the healthcare decision. Maybe he needs some plain language, maybe he needs an interpreter, etc. But really what we're trying to figure out is can he actually, you know, give informed consent to this healthcare treatment. You, but we've expanded it. The doctor's got to accommodate his different needs and we've got to make sure he's got some support. But ultimately we're still checking. Are, can, can, he really, can he really make this decision? Uh, because if he can't, then, um, you know, the, really without some other substitute representative alternative arrangement, uh, uh, the, the surgery, the treatment decision won't be able to be made. So we're still, we've, we, we haven't really broken through that traditional account of what it means to, to be a person, even as we begin to attach supports and accommodation to the functional approach. So do we need, do we need, a, do we need a new approach? Some are asking. Uh, do we even need to assess capacity? Is there any reason why we would need to do that? Isn't there just a continuum of supports after all? If someone needs 100% support, we just give it to them. Like why are, we, why are we in fact worried about assessing capacity in the first place? Doesn't the convention, isn't that the paradigm shift? Uh, it provides for support. If you need 100% support, provide people support. Um, before we go there and answer those questions, I. What I want to do is step back and look at what some other accounts of person, are there some other legitimate accounts of personhood to ground the exercise of legal capacity beyond the one that Michael with some support and accommodation can make the decision in his own head. So that's, as we know, that's going to be a, that's going to be a, a just a particular subset of the population. Um, and uh, the convention calls upon states parties and society to go beyond that uh, because it says we're not going to discriminate in the exercise uh, the recognition of the right to legal capacity uh, on the basis of disability so how do we do this are there some other accounts of personhood and um, there are in fact um, one account is focuses really on intention we're intending subjects and that's what makes us a full person we have intention, intention toward the future. We're intending subjects, and we can express preferences and will. So that notion of, of will and preferences in the convention speaks to this idea that that's actually what the core is. It doesn't say, the, the convention doesn't um, uh, 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 set out a test of the, the understand and appreciate test. It says no, actually what drives it is someone's will and preferences. And that's pretty basic, right? Um, I have desires, I have things I want to do, I have things I don't want to do. And if I can express them in some way, that's a foundation on which we can accord me legal capacity. If I can make those, and they can be really basic expressions of, uh, uh, of, of, of wants and, uh, or what I, I don't want. And I, I use this example many times just because I find it a very helpful example of a case in New York, in the state of New York in 1989, Marianne Benton wanted to move, had a mental handicap, intellectual disability, wanted to move from the state of Pennsylvania to the state of New York and, the, and wanted benefits in New York. And uh, New York in the case said, um, 
Marianne Benton doesn't understand and appreciate the nature of this decision. Uh, so she actually doesn't have the capacity to make the decision to move to New York. And the, court, the case went to court. And the, what the ruling found was that because she could express happiness at the idea of moving to New York, she wanted to move to New York, that was the basis of a justiciable right to decide, was what the ruling called it. All Marianne Bett needed to do was to express her desire to do that. She's an intending subject. She knows what she wants. She doesn't have to have all the, uh, understand all the details around all the transactions that that decision is going to um, uh, require in order to be given effect. She just needs to intend it. So that's, that's a very different account of personhood than what, you, what the functional test is usually based on. And I think it, we can even go further to, to not a competing account, but a distinctly um, expanded account that um, we're intersubjective beings. Michael doesn't actually exist in his head. He exists in the space between himself and others and others who, with whom he's intimate, with, who care about him and whom he cares about. That's where he exists. And in fact, he's held in the world not just by what goes on in his own head, God forbid, if you knew what went on in my own head, he's actually held most coherently in the space with others. Uh, and there we're talking about the capacity to be known as a person. And um, this is a picture of a young woman, Rebecca Biani, who uh, uh, I know well, and mostly I know her family well, but we've met a, num you know, a, a number of times. And Rebecca is a, uh, a woman with significant intellectual and physical uh, disabilities. Um, but she uh, is uh, an artist, quite an accomplished artist. You can look, on, look her up on a, a website. She um, has a headband. She moves the, her headband to point to the light on a canvas, and a painter will follow her, her movements. She is a dancer. Um, uh, and this is one of the, they're, they're doing a rehearsal, I think, for, for a dance. Uh, she, she communicates in ways that those who know her intimately understand. And what she, what she her, her very presence is what inspires people to come around her. That's how people talk about her, who, who know her. Um, so this, this, this account of personhood is simply one that we're intersubjective. We exist in that space between the two of them, not in anybody's head. And um, what matters is that we can be known as the same person through time. Now, Rebecca is known as the same person through time because she's held in the stories that others tell about her. People refer to this you know, as the narrative approach, the nar a narrative approach to understanding subjectivity and personal identity. And human agency gets attached to that story. Right? So human agency doesn't get attached to the functional, her score on a functional test about what's going on in her, on in her head. Human agency, Rebecca's agency is attached to the story that others are able to tell about her, because that's where she's held. She's held in that story, in that space between them. Now, people have come at this in various ways. Martin, you've heard Martin Buber writes about the I-thou relationship. People have tackled it in various ways. We're not going to go into the, the details on that. But I think it's a substantially different account than the functional test. So wh what does this mean? I think this provides us the basis for, for evolving a more inclusive theory of personal identity and human agency than we usually have access to when we think about uh, the right to legal capacity. Let's go with the language of the convention, will and preferences. That's the core, the convention tells us. And given what I've just talked about, maybe we you know, attach the word intention to that. I mean, that's, we're, we're, we're respecting, building upon, being guided by someone's intention. And let's, let's use Rebecca as the sort of example for, for, for that. Um, now, Rebecca has around her what we might call a personal network. And we're now moving into think, you know, thinking about what supported decision making looks in practice. She has around her people who know her, her family, friends, people in her dance team. And they, drawing from how they know Rebecca, they, they think of themselves as executing what she wants to do. So, Rebecca, through opportunities she was given, wanted to uh, dance. She wanted to paint. And this is how her network understands her intentions. 
and they give effect to those intentions and there's certain consequences and then they think but they wrap those consequences back to Rebecca the story they tell is that this is what Rebecca wants to do you meet her her mother she talks Susan talks about how Rebecca loves to paint how Rebecca loves to dance so they're weaving the consequences that they make possible back to her agency and then they they it started with her uh, in working with a, at the church they went to, I think. Uh, and so they got her included in a dance troupe at the church. That was one consequence of their understanding of her wanting to dance. And then they thought about that and she was really developing and others really loved this and they wanted to take it the next step. So they um, decided to put a major event together at uh, Massey Hall in Toronto, which is a, a big concert hall and they had bands and the dance troupe and it was a big, big success. But again, they wrapped that back to Rebecca. So, you know, Rebecca wants to dance. She's in a dance troupe. They move on to uh, hosting a big uh, event at Massey Hall. Can you imagine the number of transactions and legal relationships that were engaged in moving from this notion that Rebecca loves to move and dance with others into mounting a major concert at Massey Hall in Toronto? All kinds of legal agreements with the people who were taping it, the musicians, Massey Hall, etc. But this was inspired by and driven by Rebecca and her agency is what is seen as driving all the way through these transactions. So I use that as an example to try and make this notion of a theory of personal identity and human agency that doesn't reside on me being able to manage stuff in my head. Uh, there's a practical example of it. Um, the question that we're all going to ask or that we ask is, so are those Rebecca's actions or are those her personal network's actions? Who, who, who do the consequences belong to? And this is one of the biggest, I think, one of the dilemmas that we have to think about. Who do, the, who do the, the actions and the consequences belong to? And I think we need to think through a theory, and I think there's a basis to do that, to say they belong to Rebecca. Um, yes, she uses her network to execute a variety of transactions, but those transactions belong to Rebecca because they're, they, they're, they're driven and inspired by her intention. And I... I Donald Davidson, who's a, a, an American analytic philosopher, uh, has done a lot. Has done a lot of work on a theory of human agency, based on the relationship between intention and action. And he talks about how the most what, intention is expressed in the most basic bodily movement. So Rebecca's bodily movements are not ones that most people can understand unless you're in her, her network. But what he he says is that. We don't transfer agency from one event to another. So we don't transfer agency from uh, Rebecca to her network. It's not her network that has agency. Rebecca has agency. Um, so there aren't, aren't uh, um, or, or in, he's using an example here of a man stopping a car. Um, or infer that the man was agent not only of one action, but of two. Like he was an agent of putting his foot on the brake and then the brake stopped the, the car. The man stopped the car. There were a number of transactions or steps along the way, but we basically talk about one action and that belongs to his agency. And he has a very, very, I think, critical and critically important line for us. And where he says is there aren't any further actions, there's only further descriptions. It's how we decide to describe the set of events about we can, we can write them in a way that attach agency to the person or write them in a way that we divide the agency up and remove the agency from the person, which is what we do in uh, case assessments of people with intellectual disabilities, for example, all the time. Um, so there's an accordion. You're going, okay, Michael, now this is really, we're really beginning to stretch it here. I was thinking we should, Gerard, I should have had Gerard playing in the background through this presentation. Why an accordion? Because in 1965, Joel Feinberg wrote a really interesting article, 1965, where he talked about the accordion effect. And this comes back to the point of description. It, he says, it's all in how you decide to describe the set of actions. You can, with the bellows of the accordion, you can extend it or you can play it tightly, right? It's all in the description. It's all in how we decide to describe the actions and the set of events that come, up, come out of it. And again, around people with significant disabilities, imagine the case files of descriptions 
about what they do and what they're not able to do. It's a brilliant little article if you ever get a chance. Um, okay, another concept. I know we're moving a lot across a lot of territory. It's all going to come together. Maybe we're, we're not talking about capacity. What are we talking Are we talking about capacity to exercise legal capacity? Because ultimately that's what the functional test comes down to. We're talking about assessing mental capacity to exercise legal capacity. Limited notion, as we've said. I think the notion of decision-making ability, as, as uh, Jerome said yesterday, is a, provides us the theoretical foundations on which uh, we can provide a much fuller account and a more inclusive account and assessment uh, of, of what's needed to exercise legal capacity. And as he said yesterday, the decision-making uh, capability approach takes someone's unique abilities adds to them supports and accommodation, and in this case, we end up with decision-making capability. So if we did a functional test of Rebecca Biani, um, she uh, wouldn't meet the test for exercising legal capacity. In fact, and I've shared this story, and, and uh, I've asked her mom about sharing it, and she's good with it. She says if it helps people understand. Um, because there isn't a legal framework in Ontario for supported decision-making, um, they, uh, her family has decided to place her under guardianship. So Rebecca is now under the guardianship of her parents uh, because they're concerned about all the things parents are concerned about from if, if something happens to them, about property, about health care, around any number of things. She's very vulnerable in a number of ways. Uh, so they went to meet with the lawyer and prepare their applications for guardianship and you have to provide an account of this person. So they, they Susan wrote up the account and the, the lawyer said, it was a social worker lawyer, I forget, said, oh my God, you're never going to get guardianship. You've got to write a different story. I mean, you're never going to get guardianship. Rebecca's so competent. Why? The court's not going to appoint you guardianship. Because she wrote the story as they know they're her daughter. In their story, in their account of Rebecca, she's a dancer, she's an artist, she's spoken at the UN, she participates. Like, why would anybody get why, why would you award guardianship in that case? It was all in the description. It was all in how the family described. So, what did she have to do? She had to go back and re-describe the events, right? She had, to dis she had to extract the agency from Rebecca in how they told the story so that the court would award guardianship because that was the only fr framework they had. Remember what, what, what uh, uh, Davidson says, there's no, there's no further actions, there's only further descriptions and re-descriptions. And that's what we're dealing with. How are we going to tell the story about Rebecca's life and who she is? And it matters, right? It really matters because she's now under guardianship. Because the story that would be told and that is known about, about Rebecca doesn't have any, any, there's no legal framework to hear the story in a way that would give her status. So in this framework, Rebecca has, you would have unique abilities yeah, attached to that support and accommodation and she would have decision-making capability. So... Does the continue, we've been talking in our various conversations over the last few years about a continuum notion of supports. So if we put a continuum notion of abilities, supports and accommodation, what we would call decision making abilities together, would this provide us a, a, a sound basis for law, policy and practice? Now, sociologically, we could line everybody up and of course there's a continuum. But does it actually provide a sound basis for law, policy and practice? And is, is the continuum in, uninterrupted in a legal sense? Do we uninterrupt it? Or must we recognize that, that, in fact, there are substantively different ways of exercising legal capacity in order to protect both individuals and the public interest? So I, and, and my view is, it's probably clear, is there isn't a sound, it doesn't provi provide us a sound basis. And let's take a few examples of decisions. What about non-therapeutic sterilization? People um, who meet the functional test can decide to do non-therapeutic sterilization. Would we do that for someone in a, who needs 100% of supports? We'd say, well, actually, not so sure that it works there, but what about assisted suicide? I, one of the, the readings I put up on the, the uh, uh, it was just a press release uh, that we issued last week because the BC, BC Supreme Court last Friday came down with the decision um, uh, there's been prohibition against uh, assist, assisted, physician assisted or assisted suicide in our criminal code. 
and a woman who has a ALS went to court for the right to assisted suicide. Um, and we, there was a big case about 10 years ago, and the Supreme Court of Canada rejected the, the, pro, the, um, uh, the, the, the challenge to the law. But BC Supreme Court switched it and came down and said, yes, there is, there is, a, there is a right. To, the, the, the criminal code provisions don't meet the charter test that Jerome la laid out yesterday for, yesterday for us, the Section 15 equality test. Basically, what the judgment says is that it's a violation of the equality rights of people with disabilities to deny them assisted suicide. Uh, because basically, assisted suicide is, a, is an accommodation. So this is one of the ways in which our work on equality rights has come back to haunt us. We, I mean, we've been working against this, uh, 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 this, this judgment and, this, and, and in terms of law reform. But, when it, but, but basically, the court has now said, yes, assisted suicide is, is legal. Um, now, would, if someone had required 100% of supports, would we provide for would we enable them to have access to, to assisted suicide? Prostitution's just been legalized through a case in Canada. As I come up with these examples, I go back to yesterday, and you know what, George, and, and others? I would have, I mean, a part of me goes back, why don't we just let God decide? Really? You know, it's really looking. He's out of the jurisdiction. <laughs> he, he is out of the jurisdiction. So, and, 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 uh, so there's been a, a, a this, this isn't irrelevant to, to the issues that certainly the people that we advocate around. Uh, was, it came out a few years ago about um, uh, some young people with intellectual disabilities who were homeless. They had been abandoned by their families um, and uh, on the street and were picked up in a prostitution ring. Now, should we provide for people with intellectual disabilities to participate in legal, legalized, I mean, if, if they choose to, of course, but someone who has 100% support needs, or 50, or 45, I'm not sure. And what about donating blood? This was another one we've just been involved in. So a young woman with an intellectual disability, recent, um, no, she's now landed immigrant. Um, one of the contributions she wanted to make was to donate blood. And uh, this was a way that she could make a contribution. Um, give a gift. That's how. That's the basis of donating blood in 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 Canada. It's a gift. Um, so she went to the uh, Red Cross to give blood, um, but she needed her support person um, to assist in understanding the screening questions. Uh, but the rules of the Canadian uh, Blood Agency are that. Uh, you, you first can get some assistance in filling out the form, but when you go back behind the, the, literally the screen to meet with the nurse, you have to go by yourself. You can't go with a spouse, you can't go with a friend, you have to go by yourself because of the risk that you could be, your answers could be influ influenced by the presence of the person there. Well, we, you know, we were, they came to us, our association, and this seems like, you know, this, this is a legal relationship. This is another, and, and she should have the power to enter this legal relationship. This is one way in, she, in which she can really make a contribution, in which she can give a gift, um, and uh, be recognized as a full citizen in our society. And they, when, when, when we were coming, they pulled out the stops, the Canadian medical director with the Canadian blood services, it was a big, and um, we did, I did my thing about the convention and supports and supported decision making. And they said, we really respect that but we have the Canadian blood supply to protect. And uh, we said, well, why would you, you know, she's not gonna, she's, they said, well, we have to protect the Canadian blood supply. We, unless someone, that could be their care provider, may be influencing them, maybe she doesn't want her care provider, or her mother to know that she's having a sexual relationship with someone, we have to protect the Canadian blood supply. Uh, uh, and we understand the point about accommodation, and you can take us to the Human Rights Tribunal. We don't think it'll go any, you know, we're not sure it would even be uh, a, a case that you can mount, but um, our job is to, to protect the Canadian blood supply. I said, well, don't we have all the screening technology? He said, yeah. They said, even after, there, there are still um, false positives, or uh, the, yeah, yeah false, false negatives, false negatives. Um, which I didn't realize. So the, the technology doesn't screen out, um, uh, do, doesn't assure 100% um, uh, uh, screening. So we pulled back 
So what we're talking about now is developing some tools that can assist people to prepare for the screening on their own. But it does mean that people who have, may have 50% support needs around, or 100 aren't going to be able to go and give blood. They're not going to be able to make that gift. And that's because we have a public interest to protect. Um, so I use these just as, as examples. That these are some of the challenges that we're facing as we think through this, this uh, 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 legal capacity issue. So maybe we're thinking about a modified functional approach. Um, so it's a functional assessment of decision-making capability, not to determine if one can exercise legal capacity, but to determine how one's decision-making capability can be maximized, given other obligations to protect from harm and the public interest. So we're, we're, think, about, think about employment accommodation. We assess someone's physical disabilities along with the workspace and the need for computer-assisted technology to enable one to be capable in that work environment. And that's maybe what we're assessing here. What's the particular individual ability someone has and what kind of supports and accommodation do we attach to that to give them decision-making capability? So I think that there are different ways to exercise legal capacity. And that provides the long theoretical sort of justification for actually moving away from a continuum notion to say there are very, there are some clear boundaries. And um, many of you have probably seen this one way or the other. So there we have the, the state who recognizes my right to make decisions. I've got to decide which way I'm going to go to around this surgery or where I'm going to live. The state also uh, establishes or recognizes the duty to accommodate on part of that dentist and doctor and financial institution and the employer and the landlord. Um, and that's the community. That's where I'm, I'm trying to get to. And that's what the convention's all about. How am I going to make my way to the community? And what legal capacity is about is what are the ways in which I'm going to get there? Most of us make our way independently. Um, and with support, we're all intersubjective beings, all of that, but ultimately, I can go into the doctor, today anyway, I could go into the doctor by myself, and we could have the patient-doctor relationship, and I could decide to take the treatment or not to take it. Uh, the doctor's got to accommodate me, there's got to be plain language if I require, etc. cetera. Um, another approach that we've been advancing is supported decision-making, right? And that's where we have a network of people, like Rebecca has around her, who are recognized and given status, and that's the way I, I make my way to the community. It's through a distinct status. This isn't a continuum. There are very distinct statuses and, and duties and obligations that attach to the different actors, depending on which way I'm making my, my, making my way. Another way is a representative approach. Um, oh, I didn't know the gears turn. <laughs> this, so in, in this picture, um, I've, there, there's, there's my representative, and his wheels are turning about how he's going to act on my direction. Um, I may have uh, established a power of attorney, or if the jurisdiction provides an advanced directive for health care, and I've appointed a representative. It, the, the representative is a representative. He's not a supporter. He's, got, he's bound by my, what my directive is, what's in my power of attorney, etc. But he's representing me. He's not supporting me to make decisions. He's representing me. That's a distinctive way of exercising my legal capacity. And a, a, a fourth way, and I, we're still, we've got a team of us kind of drafting some draft legal framework in the Canadian context. And I'm not sure about this, but I, I think it is probably helpful to, to distinguish a fourth, which we've called facilitated uh, decision making. And that's for people who have no one, they can't act e independently, they don't meet that decision making capability test, uh, or the usual functional test. Uh, they don't have anyone who can support them. Um, they're completely isolated. Many people can find institutions. Uh, people we know are very isolated. Uh, uh, I haven't set up a planning, uh, advanced planning document, but I need some decisions to be made, or I'm going to be in a risk, a risk of serious harm, neglect, uh, w whatever. Some decisions need to be made, and, and so maybe a facilitated status is where there's a competent authority that then appoints that facilitator, which is this guy with the gears, um, to make my way to the community. So it's really important to distinguish supports for decision making, communication, assistance, personal support, from supported decision making. We may find different terms or whatever, but these are two really different things. Uh, supported decision making is a, a status. 
It's a legal right to have certain others recognized in the decision-making process to enter legal relationships who are in a demonstrated trusting relationship of personal knowledge and commitment. That defines a particular way that I'm going to make my way to the community. It's those two people who are supporting me, not those two people. And there's got to be an authoritative appointment and recognition of those two over those two because those two may want access to my property and we've got to provide some, some way of distinguishing. It's a legal requirement that those supporters meet certain duties and it's a legal requirement that, that the third parties respect and accommodate such a decision-making process. So I would define supported decision-making in really narrow, um, uh, defined uh, uh, terms. Um, how do we put that into practice? Um, I'm going to tie up in about five minutes. Um, here's, here's again my, my uh, little man on the screen who's at a crossroads trying to decide which way to go. We have the state who's, the, 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 that's me trying to decide which way to go. We've got the state and we've got my support network. And we've got this community, right? Remember that I'm trying to make my way to because I've got decisions to make. Uh, the state recognizes my right to make to exercise my legal capacity and provides a framework of supports, protection from abuse, et cetera, advocacy. Uh, it also recognizes and provides for, for me to uh, make, enter these arrangements, backup support to the network, possibly registration of networks, et cetera. We're not going to go into the details on that and a monitoring of that group because they're accountable to me. Um, and uh, law policy practice also protects uh, uh, third parties and it funds the community capacity to enable this system to be put in place. I appoint my supporters, or they are appointed in cases where, or this is the proposal, where I have a really profound intellectual disability and I wouldn't meet the test for being able to make that kind of appointment, even if it's a really low threshold. And we've got to accept that there are people who are in that situation. And um, some have suggested it makes a mockery of appointment to suggest that people can do that. It's not that they don't have abilities, they have unique abilities and they need other kinds of supports. So in that case, the arrangement would provide for those who are in a demonstrated trusting relationship with me to apply to be appointed on the basis of evidence that would uh, let us know that that uh, relationship in fact existed. And then my network uh, or supporters listen, advise, help communicate, and narrate, as we talked about before, my agency. Because that, in that case, I'm really going to need someone to uh, uh, guide these various transactions based on what, what their, their interpretation, their description of who I am. Um, so we've got basically four ways to exercise legal capacity, legally independently, supported decision making, representative decision-making, and facilitated decision-making. This is a suggestion, a way of um, defining some of those boundaries, because I think unless we defi de defi de define those boundaries, we're not going to take full account of the duties and responsibilities that attach to different ways of exercising legal capacity. There's also a relationship with them, uh, between them. And because I think there's also a duty to maximize decision-making capability, um, uh, here are four ways, independent, supported, representative. If supports and accommodations aren't yet feasible, I, would be in a supported, I could be in a supported decision-making status. Um, but I may have already appointed my uh, attorney um, or advanced directive and I've had a serious uh, uh, brain injury and I'm not able to operate in a supported status, but I have a representative arrangement in place. Um, uh, so the supports and accommodation aren't yet feasible, but I have a representative and we may not have that representative in place, so we're in a facilitated status. But we also make our way back up. If I'm appointed a facilitator, there should be a duty on the state to ensure that there's an investment in, in building personal relationships around me. Because at that point, maybe my only capacity that isn't yet uh, realized fully is I have a capacity to be known as a full person but I don't have people yet who know my story, know my ways of communicating. There should be an obligation given what's at stake to invest in the development of those relationships. Similarly, so as supports and accommodation be, become feasible, I make my way back up. That's just a, a you know, we could, it's just to illustrate the, the kind of relationship that, between status, support, and accommodation. Um, Okay, let's, let's think about implementation then. Given, if that's a kind of theoretical grounding, 
that I think is justified given the paradigm shift in theory and values in the convention. Let's think about how do we start to put this into place. Article 12 is a guide, but even beyond, we, we were talking this morning about core obligations. And I think, you know, people have said, you know, Article 12 is related to Article 19, right to live in the community, etc. I, I think the first step, though, is to think about its relationship to the core obligations that you talked about this morning. Right to health. You mentioned emergency treatment. How we think about emergency treatment, I think, helps us, um, and, and what the parameters of that are will help us to deal with some of the protection issues, um, and I want to come back to that. Um, and, and alternatives around legal capacity when people are in a situation of, of uh, potential harm or, or abuse. Uh, liberty and security can, can be deprived only by law, not on a disability, the basis of disability and in accordance with international law. And I want to come back to that. Um, Article 15, freedom from torture, cruelty, etc., speaks to the protection role of the state. So it's, again, it, there, there are a number of parameters in the core obligations that shape how, how legal capacity is going to be recognized. The protective role of the state is really important, I think, to to uh, articulate and, and um, uh, yesterday I think Gerard was talking about how you, the need to shift, of, or what the convention does is shift us away from a paternalistic approach. It's, the, the pendulum is swinging back from the paternalistic protective um, uh, model back to one that emphasizes autonomy, but the protective role of the state doesn't go away. And it's clear in the convention, the, the convention provides the parameters of that. Um, protecting integrity of the person, and I want to come back to this in a minute, but Article 17 um, uh, is, is critical when we think about do we regulate certain types of decisions that affect fundamentally men mental and physical integrity on the basis of the way in which I exercise my status. And I want to talk about that in a second. So what are the obligations when it comes to, to Article 12? Um, it sets, I think, an obligation, and the, law, the international folks in international law, are, I'm, I'm not making any analysis in that way, okay, folks? That's, that's going to be up to you. This is my own sociologist policy kind of guy uh, trying to think this through um, in conversations with various people across the, my country and around the world. Um, it speaks to the need to have some legal framework to recognize the, the, the right to legal capacity. As a first step, do we abolish plenary guardianship? Do we need a fra framework legislation for legal capacity or do we need a comprehensive approach? And I want to I want to illustrate the distinctions between those in a second. I think it speaks very much to the need for an inclusive approach to testing decision making capability. We've got to come up with a test that is inclusive without distinction without without uh, discrimination on the basis of disability. And the functional test even modified doesn't do it. The functional test, even modified, um, as we have to acknowledge supports and accommodation, remains discriminatory, I would argue, in light of the convention. We need a more inclusive test. Uh, we need to provide for establishing that range of decision-making arrangements. Is it independent? Is it supported? Is it representative? Is it facilitated? Uh, if you accept that, in fact, there are distinct ways of exercising legal capacity to which different kinds of duties and obligations attach, we need to provide some, some ways. A framework needs to provide some ways for entering those. Um, there needs to be a system for providing supports, and there needs to be safeguards and protection. Let's, let's, so let's take up a few of these in terms of what that obligation might actually require. In terms of a comprehensive approach, so in the various projects that I've been involved in Canada and around the world, all of these areas of law are brought into the picture. They all regulate legal capacity in one way or the other. It's a huge task. Adult protection, criminal law, evidence law, elections, corporate and company, healthcare consent, guardianship, mental health law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, creating uh, a, a, a comprehensive approach then would look at that whole picture and try and move it forward. We know politically, uh, theoretically, it's not possible. So do we start with a core framework around legal capacity and then use that as a lens to begin to uh, work in some other areas of law? Some, in some initiatives, I'll mention after the break, uh, you know, some are working on mental health law reform, 
I've got some concerns about, as their way in to addressing Article 12, my concern about it is that they're not doing it on the foundation of a really rethought legal capacity framework. So it, it, it's, it's operating within the usual confines of mental health law and isn't going to come anywhere near to being compliant with Article 12. Sorry, is there some water? <coughs> I'll, I'll give you a break from listening to me while I uh, get some water. I want to talk about an inclusive test of functional capacity that we've been working on in Canada with a team of lawyers. Um, you the usual test, functional capacity, you know, I understand the nature, pre appreciate and understand, understand and appreciate the nature um, uh, uh, of the foreseeable consequences, etc. What we're suggesting is that that appreciation may rest either within the adult him or herself or within the understanding and appreciation of the persons appointed to support the adult. Going back to that whole story of Rebecca, right? So the understand, understanding and appreciate can, can be either in my own head or in that intersubjective space between myself and the others who are appointed or recognized to support me. Because, going back to the earlier point, if that's where I exist as a, per, a person in relation to others, Understanding and, understanding and appreciation can reside there. Um, if it's B, that is within the understanding and appreciation of the persons appointed to support me, there needs to be some requirements that it's made, that any decision that comes out of that process is made for the sole benefit of the adult. It's guided by the support person's best understanding and appreciation of my intention. It, they, they have a, a, a responsibility to be guided by Rebecca's intention in executing in various legal relationships and transactions how they understand that intention, all of which are going to be tied back to her agency, right? Um, and where support person's best understanding and appreciation means interpreting the adult's behavior or communication in a present or previous situations as the expression of the adult's will or preferences, and being able to provide a reasonable account of that interpretation. Going back to David Donaldson, you need to be able to provide a description of how you arrived at that understanding and appreciation. This is what Rebecca wants. This is how we understand Rebecca's form of communication. This is, what, this is why we, we entered this relationship. And though even, um, you know, and whatever liabilities then might, might attach to that description, there's got to be evidence that it's a reasonable um, account. And when you, when you come right down to it, we only, um, I think I poured the water but didn't drink it. Mm. When we're dealing, we're, we, none of us know what's going on in each other's heads. We don't even know what's, what's, what's going on in our own heads and hearts half the time, right? And we're all, what we're trying to do is understand each other. That's what, that's what interpretation is all about. We're dealing simply with accounts that we give. And that's, there, so it doesn't need to be a big stretch into this second approach to thinking about um, uh, uh, the, 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 the capacity to, to appreciate and understand as residing uh, but in, in, in this space between us. It is really being true to the accordion effect. Um, does all, the, the obligations then flowing out of Article 12, we'd need some new authorities to provide, to help activate, develop, manage new arrangements. In the Canadian statutory framework we're working on, um, we're calling it the Legal Capacity and Support Office. Its job is to assist people in entering supported arrangements, representative arrangements, and uh, to be available to assist in identifying facilitators. We'd need, we'd need some adult protection authority. If we don't have it, um, well, we do have it, depending on how it's organized. But it, it need, it's going to have to be really be guided by a, a deep understanding of what Article 12 means and to move even away from the usual paternal approaches. But we're going to need adult protection. And we're going to need a competent court, tribunal, board to deal with the various disputes that are undoubtedly going to arise about, can I act independently? I want to act independently. Why are you telling me I need to take a supporter into the doctor's office? I can meet the, that capaci the functional capacity test A. Actually, no, Michael, we don't think you can. Um, you have to go B with this one. You're going to have to have a supporter. There are going to be those disputes, right? Um, uh, it would provide for legally authorized decision-making arrangements, as I said, and for making, changing, and revoking those arrangements. Um, 
Uh, it would, the framework would establish duties, powers, liabilities of supporters, representatives, facilitators, recognize the duty to accommodate, etc., mandate community-based supports um, in terms of providing a planning process for this. Interesting, when we we we're working on this uh, draft framework in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, um, and met with the community agencies, and it provides for designating community agencies to provide the supports. And it, this isn't straightforward. They weren't ready to take on these functions. It imposes all kinds of new liabilities for them to think about being positioned to be providing support to people to exercise their legal capacity and raising all kinds of questions for them about how those liabilities would manage. Not impossible, but is going to require a very extensive planning process to figure out. And what supports to exercise legal capacity? What's the list? Is it a list? Is it a menu? Or is it, in fact, you know, individual planning and facilitation, independent advocacy, uh, the personal ombuds approach in Sweden, a peer support, personal network assisting, assistance, uh, or building assistance in building a personal network. We could sort of imagine a list, but maybe it's any support or accommodation. But this is going to be a, a question. How wide a range of supports uh, if, uh, might we include in what states' parties should be accountable for ensuring people have access to?